I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors. On a rainy night in 1970, Captain Jeffrey McDonald, a surgeon and a Green Beret, made a frantic call for help. His family had been brutally murdered, but wasn't attacked by crazed, drugged out hippies, or did McDonald kill his entire family? and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my exacting co-host, Alice. Exacting? Am I really that exact? I don't know if I am. (laughs) And the the person who suggested that wanted you to know they meant it in the good way, not the, like, negative way. Because I guess there's a positive and a negative way to look at exacting. You know, it's one of those, like, compliments that that is actually a put-down, because I thought exacting was a compliment until you said it was not a compliment. <laughs> well, it can be a compliment, but it might also be not a compliment, right? There you it's go. like being earnest. There you go. You know, it can be good to be earnest, or it can be bad to be earnest if you're too earnest. So I think it's the same thing. I think it it is a compliment or not a compliment, depending on who's saying it, but in this case, we definitely mean it as a compliment, so <laughs> Thanks, compliments Brett. to you, Alice. <laughs> So today we are beginning our journey through the Jeffrey McDonald case. I think you guys probably have all heard of this case. It is one of the most famous and controversial cases in true crime. If there's one thing we love, it's controversy. <laughs> I love it, Brett. <laughs> it's just like asking people yeah, to come to and attack us. You said you loved controversy. Exactly. We love controversy. And this is a controversial case. It it's really a case is. that people fa- feel very passionately about one way or the other. And I'll just say, this is one of the cases that really got me into true crime. This is one of those that I kind of fell down the rabbit hole on about 10 years or so ago. And I read all the books. I read Fatal Vision, and I read Wilderness of Error, and I read The Journalist and the Murderer. I mean, all of them. I was fascinated by this case, and this is one that we've been wanting to cover. And then a few weeks ago... We did a live get vocal for Maggie Freeling on her Patreon with the wonderful ladies from Women and Crime, and this was the case we discussed. And Alice and I thought, let's do a deep dive on this, and that's why we're here, and that's what we're going to do. And I don't know how long this is going to take, how many episodes this is going to be, but I hope you guys will stick with us, because this is, I think, one of the most interesting cases in the history of true crime. It's fascinating, Brett. I'm so glad we're diving into this. You know, I really was researching it just for our Get Vocal, and in researching it, my jaw was just dropped the entire time. So for those people out there who don't know what we're talking about, why don't you tell us a little bit about this case? Well, as I said in the introduction, this is a case that goes all the way back to 1970, and it was the kind of case that grabbed the attention of people across this country. This was a case... If you were alive in 1970, you knew about this case, you followed it, you saw it. It was one of those cases that was big before crime dominated the headlines. I mean, we sort of think of maybe the the O.J. Simpson case as one of the first examples of a case that attracted national attention. But really, this case was kind of like that because of the circumstances of, of what happened here. You had someone... Captain Jeffrey McDonald, who was not only a surgeon and a doctor, but also a Green Beret, and his entire family was murdered. And he said they were murdered by a group of crazed, drugged out hippies. Now, 1970, this is the time of the Manson family murders. This is a time when people are really worried about this. They're concerned about this. They're worried about groups of people like the Manson family going around and murdering innocent people. And it seemed like you had that happening here in North Carolina, on the other side of the country, from where the Manson murders happened. But very quickly, the people who were investigating this crime began to doubt that it was committed 
by an intruder and instead began to think that the unthinkable had happened, that Captain Jeffrey McDonald, the golden boy, the surgeon, the Green Beret, father of two daughters with a son on the way, had brutally destroyed his own family. So let's go through the story here and lay this out in detail. At 3.40 a.m. on Tuesday, February 17th, 1970, Jeffrey McDonald, a surgeon and Green Beret stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, makes a frantic call to MPs. Later on, on April 6, 1970, he would be interviewed by people investigating this crime, and here is the story that he would tell them in a recorded interview, as I said, very shortly after this happened, and this is the story that he would tell for the rest of his life. He says that on Monday, February 16th, so the day before, his wife got home at around 9.30 from a class she was taking. She was taking some classes. They were both relatively, well, they were both very young. I'm not even going to say relatively. Both of them were 26 years old. They had known each other for a long time. In fact, they had been high school sweethearts. So she returns home from a class. The girls, his two girls, Kristen, age two, and Kimberly, age five, were already in bed. The two sort of, you know, they're relaxing. They're winding down from the day. They're watching Johnny Carson together. In fact, McDonald would later make a joke about this on the Dick Cavett show when he appeared on that show to talk about this tragedy that he was watching another late night show that night. At some point around midnight, his wife goes to bed while he stays up until about two reading. At some point, he also washed the dishes. Now, this is something to remember because it'll, it will strike you as a little unusual as we dive into this case. McDonald had done a double shift at the hospital. By some accounts, he had been up for about 48 hours at this time. So it may seem strange to you that he stays up so late reading and then he's also washing dishes. But in addition to this, he was taking part in a experimental program with the military where he was taking some amphetamines that I believe they were testing to see about weight loss. Obviously, amphetamines also give you a lot of energy, and that might have been the reason that despite the fact he had been working so much, he was still awake at this point. So after he washes the dishes at around 2, he decides to go to bed. But his youngest daughter, Kristen, she had gotten in the bed at some point with his wife and had actually wet the bed. So McDonald picks up Kristen, takes her to her room, gives her a bottle, and then he goes to go to sleep on the couch. At some indeterminate time later, he wakes up to the sound of his wife and his oldest daughter, Kimberly, screaming. His wife is screaming, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? And his daughter is shouting, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He wakes up to all this confusion and he sees people standing at the foot of his wife's bed and there are also three men and a woman in the living room standing in front of him. The woman was holding a candle saying, kill the pigs, acid is groovy, and she was wearing a floppy hat and had stringy blonde hair. It only gets more scary at this point. McDonald's trying to get up to get to his family, but the men are hitting him. They're hitting him in the head and in the chest. One of them punches into his chest, and it's particularly painful. Presumably, this is when McDonald would have been stabbed in the chest. He later has a stab wound in his chest. McDonald continues to be beaten up by these men, and then he's hit in the head with what he thought at the time was a baseball bat. One of the men was black and wearing a military jacket with sergeant stripes. And that's really the only uh, one of the men that he, de he describes with any detail. So we know, for instance, he's described the woman as having a floppy hat and stringy blonde hair. The other people there are, are very general. They're just some guys. But you have this one gentleman who he describes as being black and wearing this military jacket with sergeant stripes. That might seem unusual to you. But, you know, we talked about this before. For whatever reason, back then, there were a lot of people who wore military jackets. They were sort of in style. So even though these were presumably hippies who weren't in the military, 
you did have this person who was wearing this jacket, though some people have speculated that maybe he was in the military and that had something to do with this. McDonald is recounting what happens. He says that the men kept punching him, and at some point, McDonald's pajama top gets pulled over his head and wrapped around his hands, and he is kind of tied up with his own pajama top, and he said he'd use the top to try and deflect the punches and stabs that were coming at him. During this time, the woman who was holding that candle told the men, hit him again. Finally, McDonald, after this uh, intense struggle, fell to the ground, and the last thing he remembered was seeing a pair of either white muddy boots or brown boots, and then he passed out. Alice, before we continue, I just got to say, can it be true? It is finally summer, and not summer like it was last year, but a summer where we are going to get a real summer where we can go out with our friends. So naturally, we started thinking about looking good after a year and change because we are going places. And that's where Faraday comes in. They make the perfect clothes for summer. Absolutely, Brett. Faraday is going to be the perfect outfit for all of us this summer. Faraday is a family-run brand making high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. You know when you're searching for that ideal summer outfit, that set, that shirt, that dress, that feels like you've had them for years, maybe it's in a gorgeous print and it fits so perfectly that it feels almost too good to be vintage, but it still looks like it might be. Well, that's Faraday. And Brett, let me tell you, I just got the Amalfi shirt in sand color. It's this button down with a beautiful ruffle collar. It was so soft and breezy that I actually chose to wear on the airplane. Now, it's a pretty high bar for me to choose you to wear on the airplane because it's a long ride. Now, this shirt was incredible. It didn't wrinkle. I was so comfortable. And you know what? I was able to walk off the plane, tuck that shirt in, and go to a business meeting, and I looked professional. I was just amazed by the shirt and all the other pieces that I've gotten, like the all-day shorts. And I picked up the short sleeve stretch playa, which is a bestseller, and there's a reason for that. It is super comfortable and fits perfectly. And Faraday is so confident. In the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. And to top it off, Faraday is giving all Prosecutors listeners 20% off. That's 20% off. So stock up on all your clothes for summer now. Head to FaradayBrand.com and use code TP at checkout to snag 20% off all your summer gear. That's code TP at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, Brand.com for 20% off. I think you can already see why this is a case that really grabbed the attention of people at the time. As we said, this is the time of the Manson murders, and you have someone who's, who is a stand-up guy. This is also the Vietnam War. I mean, everything is wrapped up in this, right? You have a guy who's in the military, who's like, you know, straight-laced guy, serving his country, and then you have these people who he describes as essentially hippies, who are on drugs, who are saying things like, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, who are invading his home, they're beating him up, and they're threatening his family. I mean, this is a story that it's a, like a made-for-television movie at the time, and it really tapped in to a lot of the concerns and the politics, everything that was going on in 1970s America. We talked about the different times, right? People were already scared because of the Manson murders, because of kind of the unknown of the the hippies, kind of. And here, this murder is highlighting what we should all be afraid of. Exactly. And either whatever you think happened here, if you think this actually happened, then it's a manifestation of that time. If you think McDonald is making this up, then he is in a very savvy way attempting to tap in to that fear and use it to his advantage. It's sort of the opposite 
of what we see in some other cases, cases like Timujin Kinsu or the West Memphis Three, where it's the government or the prosecution or the police who are trying to tap into fear in order to attack the other and, and convict the other of a crime they didn't commit. Here you have McDonald using that to his advantage to, if, if he's making it up, to put this on the other and say, the other came into my home and they attacked me and they did all these terrible things. McDonald passes out. He says he passes out. And the next thing he knows, he wakes up freezing cold. The pajama top is still wrapped around his hands. At this point, he gets his hands, you know, untangled. And he goes to the bedroom where he finds his wife on the ground with a knife in her chest. He takes the knife out of her chest, actually, and then lays the pajama top on top of her to keep her warm. He starts to give her CPR, but he can see that there's air coming out of her chest, which is obviously a bad sign. It's a little confusing exactly what he does and when he does it, and you can imagine why that would be if this is what he was going through. But at some point, he goes to check on his kids, and he sees that there's blood everywhere. At some point, he also goes back to the living room where the back door is open, and he looks outside, but he doesn't see anything. He says... The back door is usually locked, but for whatever reason, that night, it was open. He goes to the phone, he picks up the phone, tries to talk to the operator and tell them that he needs help, but the operator says he needs to call the MPs. Rather than doing that, at this point, he goes back into the bedroom to check his wife's pulse and finds none. He then goes to check on his kids again, who are who are in very bad shape. They're in their beds, they're covered in blood, they've been stabbed. At one point, he says he tried to give them CPR as well, but it was to no effect. Now he realizes that he has blood on his hands, and sort of in a daze, he wanders into the bathroom and starts to check himself out. But he can't really find any cuts. He has so much blood on him, he can't tell where he's injured. He washes his hands and goes back into the living room where he picks up the phone again and calls the MPs and reports the stabbings. The next thing he knows, he's laying next to his wife and an MP is giving him mouth to mouth. And that's where this story goes national. I mean, that is just a horrific story and one of the most gripping stories you can even imagine. There's a lot to it. So let's jump into the timeline, Brett. Let's start with who McDonald and his wife are. In August 1963, McDonald and Colette are married. They'd known each other since they were kids, and Colette was one of the women that McDonald was dating. But the difference with the other women is that Colette discovered she was pregnant, and they were relatively young, and so the two of them got married when she found out she was having uh, their baby. By McDonald's own account, he did not see this as requiring him to be faithful to Colette. That's an interesting admission from McDonald himself. I guess he's just doing the right thing by marrying Colette because she's pregnant. Yeah, McDonald's very open about his infidelities. Now, over the years that followed, McDonald had numerous affairs and at least 15 and honestly, probably more. He was unapologetic about it. McDonald himself would not characterize these trysts as affairs. He said, quote, I don't think they were real girlfriends. They were one night stands. I never had a love affair with anyone where we planned weekends away or divorce. I wore my wedding ring. It was the temper of the times. I like women, and I wasn't thinking of the consequences. I had high testosterone, and among the guys around me and people in medical school in the service, I wasn't doing anything unusual. It was 68, 70, and a lot of things were exploding. So he has spoken about this a lot, and as you can tell, in his mind, it wasn't really cheating because they were. it was just sex. It wasn't emotional. And he was just doing what any, I guess, red-blooded American man with a lot of testosterone in the 68s and 70s would be doing, having sex with lots of different women who were not his wife or the mother of his children. Yeah, and, you know, it's really interesting because it's hard to think about this case and not think about cases like Scott Peterson. But in a way, I don't know how this cuts. Obviously this is bad for him. It makes him look bad. It makes him look like he's 
kind of a scumbag, but he's so open and honest about it, it makes you wonder if it really would be a motive for murder, for instance. It's hard to believe that Colette didn't know about this, and it doesn't seem like he felt all that tied down by his family. He was perfectly willing to, you know, do whatever he wanted. So as when we talked about Scott, we had a feeling that his motive was really he didn't want to be tied down and there was a baby on the way and he knew his lifestyle was going to have to change. It doesn't seem like McDonald ever felt that way. No, not at all. Really unremorseful is what comes to mind. Now, in January of 1970, McDonald begins working out with the boxing team. Shortly thereafter, he tells Colette that he would be traveling with the team to Russia for three months. This, of course, meant that he would not be able to communicate with Colette during that time and likely would be gone when she gave birth to their son. And at this point, they already had two young daughters and she was pregnant with their son. Obviously, not a nice thing to do if you're McDonald, even if you want the opportunity to travel to Russia to be with the boxing team or whatnot. Yeah, your wife's about to have a baby. And her other pregnancies had been difficult pregnancies. They hadn't been easy. There was no indication this one would be easy either. And for him just to disappear for three months when she's got two other kids to take care of, you would think that would cause some problems in the family. Right. And it's not like he's, you know, hard up for money and this is his way to make a living for his family. He's a Green Beret surgeon who has a good job. This is a hobby. You know, this is not a way for him to make a living to support his family. This is truly just for him. It's not for Colette. It's not for his daughters. It's not for his unborn son. Um, So again, you kind of see how how he's beginning to take shape here and who what kind of man he is now the next month february 1970 colette was five months pregnant with their son and she was dealing with two young children like we mentioned earlier Kristen was only two and kimberly was five and mcdonald would later report that colette was actually happy about the fact that he was going to russia I think any one of you out there who has a significant other who may be a parent can know that that's a lie. Colette was not happy about that. Much like the trip itself, um, this was all a lie. This was just McDonald's way of uh, telling a story. Yeah, it was all made up. There was no trip to Russia. There was no boxing excursion. It's unclear what McDonald was going to do. During those three months, it's unclear if he just he just wanted to disappear and go on some, I don't know, like, you know, just travel around the country, sleeping with women, being away from his wife while she was giving birth. But one thing we know for certain is there was no boxing trip to Russia. That wasn't going to happen. The boxing team later said that was a complete fabrication. McDonald's never really explained this that I know of. Um, I've never really understood what his purpose was behind this, but it sort of gives you an idea of of the kind of person he was at the time and maybe some insight into the pressures he was feeling because of his family despite the fact that up to this point he had been he'd been willing to do whatever he'd been willing to cheat on Colette it seems like he he feels like he needs to get away from a little while and, and Rush is perfect right because as we said he would be out of communication with her there's no way to contact her from Russia in 1970 This is the height of the Cold War. You know, there's no Instagram or text messages or anything like that. So he really has set himself up to be able to get away for a little while. But it is a complete lie. And we know that Colette wasn't happy because she talked to her parents about that. More about that in a minute. So as Alice said, we've come to February 1970. This is when this crime is going to be committed. On February 14th, Colette and... Jeffrey, they have some people over, I guess, to celebrate Valentine's Day or whatnot. Ron Harrison, a good friend of McDonald's, comes over for pizza. And while he is there at the house, he and McDonald talk about the new Esquire magazine that McDonald had just received. And McDonald is particularly interested in an article in that magazine about the Shannon Tate murders, the murders committed by the Manson family, which he described as wild and went into great detail 
with his friend Ron Harrison about how crazy it was that there were these people out there who were committing these kind of crimes under the influence of drugs. The next day, February 15th, 1970, Colette calls her mom to tell her that she is, quote, not doing very well and how upset she is with Jeffrey for leaving her behind to go on this trip to Russia. And in fact, it's so bad that Colette's talking about leaving Jeffrey. She's talking about ending this marriage despite the fact that she's five months pregnant. And in fact, she asks her mom if she can leave and just come home, bring the kids and come home. Now, her mother, in an effort to save this marriage, and remember, her parents have known Jeffrey his whole life. These are high school sweethearts. They have known each other for forever. Jeffrey grew up with Colette. And her mom, I think, like most people, she's trying to save the marriage. She's trying to keep her daughter from doing anything rash. And she says, just give it till spring. If things are still bad, then you can come home. Two days later, Colette would be dead. I mean, that's devastating, Brett, with, um, you know, Colette really feeling the pressures of things. Things are not good, uh, obviously, with what she thinks is an upcoming trip to Russia. And this is not just because of the Russia trip. They've had a rocky marriage, and she's facing the barrel of potentially being a single mother to three young children, but she's finding that preferable to being continually married to McDonald. That's how bad things are right now. And this is an important insight into their relationship because the story McDonald will tell after the murders is that they essentially were perfect. They had a perfect relationship. They were happy to the extent he was having affairs. Colette didn't care. She was very supportive of him and everything he did. If he wanted to go to Russia, by goodness, she was supportive of him going to Russia. And not only was she supportive of it, she was happy he was going to do it. And then you have Colette who gives a few hints to her mother about the real situation in the household and how things are going. Now, what does that mean? You know, we talk about this a lot and we talked about this with Scott Peterson. It is always dangerous to try and figure out what's going through the heads of people. You never know what's going on behind closed doors, but I do think it is important when you're thinking about these cases, it's not just about the evidence. And sometimes people, people say, I, you know, one thing I don't like about you guys is I just want to hear the evidence. I don't want to hear how people would react in the situation or their state of mind. How can we know that? And I just don't think that's actually very realistic. I think when we look at evidence, it's not just, it's not just the cold record, right? It's not just the fingerprint was here. The blood was there. Part of that is evaluating the circumstances and the situation and the evidence and, and the state of mind of the people who were involved in the situation. And I think that's what you tried to do here. And I think it's one thing juries have to do. They have to think about that. It goes to motive. It goes to the circumstances. It goes to why this would happen. No one murders their family out of the blue for no reason. That just doesn't happen. And if you don't try and dig down into the minds of these people and what they're thinking and what they're doing, I don't think you can ever really understand or know uh, the truth that's behind these stories. So that brings us to February 17th, 1970. As we said, this is the day the murder occurs. Now, we have already told you the story that Jeffrey McDonald tells about what happened that day. And let's pick up where we left off earlier with McDonald waking up and, and someone being there. So at around 3.40 a.m. is when the call went out to the MPs. Now, we talked about this earlier. McDonald says he read till about 2, then he washes some dishes, he falls asleep on the couch, Apparently, very shortly thereafter, this crime begins because McDonald will also be knocked out for some period of time. So very shortly after he goes to sleep, this crime begins. He wakes up. He calls the emergency line, and he says something that's kind of weird. I don't know how much he can read into this. We've talked about this before, trying to read in the words people use when they call in emergencies. He says, some people have been stabbed at the house. You know, not his wife's been stabbed, not his kids have been stabbed, just some people have been stabbed. That is, and that is so strange when you've been stabbed as well, right? You would think that you'd say something like, we've been stabbed, we've been attacked, someone's got us, you know. It, it is a strange thing to say because it's not active 
you know, when we, we, when we edit briefs, you know, we are always editing out passive voice. This is some people who knows who had been stabbed, not they are, they've stabbed us, you know, that's active. For something so traumatic to be said kind of passively is a strange utterance. And I'll also say this, and once again, I just want to, I just want to highlight this because we get this a lot when we do these. We're not saying that any one thing points to his guilt or innocence. We're not saying, well, Jeffrey McDonald's is guilty because he used the passive voice when he said that his family had been stabbed. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying, like we often say, is you look at these cases, you have the evidence, and it is a mosaic. It's a picture that you're painting. It's a, it's a building that you're creating. It's a foundation you're laying. And every little piece is important and tells part of the story. Everybody knows that you use passive voice when... You don't want to claim responsibility for something, right? The whole like mistakes were made, right? <laughs> like, like that kind of, that kind of thing. You're distancing yourself from what happened. Not saying I made a mistake or we made a mistake. It's mistakes were made. And here you have a similar circumstance. Some people had been stabbed. It's just, it's a weird way to describe it. And it does feel like he's distancing himself subconsciously, obviously, from the crime that had occurred. Brett, before we move on, I have to tell you about one of my favorite sponsors, Felix Gray. Felix Gray, about five years ago, realized that our eyes weren't meant to look at screens all day and designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. Now, more than ever, Americans are spending more time on computers, phones, tablets, gaming, and so many other sources of blue light. Brett, you and I are attorneys. We are staring at computer screens all day. Now we have Felix Gray glasses that filter out blue light. And Felix Gray lenses filter 15 times more blue light. And that's the light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. And you can get these glasses in prescription and non-prescription. Check them out now. FelixGrayGlasses.com slash TP. Alice, I ordered the Hamilton glasses. Now, you know I'm a contacts person. Usually I wear my contacts until my eyes are about to fall out. But I have been wearing these glasses pretty much nonstop because I like them that much. Brett, same here. I love my Sazerac Crystal Felix Gray glasses. And when I know I have to sit down and write a brief, I put those on and, you know, no more headaches. My eyes don't get fatigued. They're great. And, you know, with their 30-day money-back guarantee, there's really nothing to lose but eye strain. So get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hard-working eyes. You have nothing to lose except maybe eye strain. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash TP for the best blue light glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash TP. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. felixgrayglasses.com slash TP. Now we'll talk about McDonald's injuries Later, he is taken to the hospital. He has been stabbed. He will be discharged from the hospital on February 26th, 1970. So about nine days later, which is, you know, not a short period of time to spend in the hospital. In 1970, I don't know. I feel like they kept in the hospital longer in 1970. Now, you know, you get shot. They don't even let you stay overnight or whatever. But he was there for nine days. We'll talk about his injuries and, and whether or not they were serious. So he has that interview with the investigators in April, the one where he tells his story. By May 1st, the Army has charged McDonald with murder. One really quick note there, um, Brett. Note that it's the Army that charges McDonald. And remember earlier in the story when he claims that he tried to call the police and the operator said to call the MP, the military police? This is interesting because we're here in Fort Bragg where the jurisdiction is the Army's. And so, no, it's not the state uh, that's charging McDonald, but it's the Army. That is an interesting thing, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an impact on this case, really, for the rest of time, about how this goes. I, I, I admit I'm not an expert on military justice. 
I'm not either, except just just to note that, you know, we've talked about jurisdictions before on the podcast. Jurisdictions just means there there's an area, kind of like your kingdom, for different law enforcement. So states within the localities, we've talked about how, you know, there's the local, county, state, those sorts of things. Different law enforcement have different, different jurisdictions. Now, the military is interesting because it's part of the the government, the federal government, but there's special rules that govern military bases and there's military law that governs military bases as well. And so they are different types of charges, different laws that apply and different processes in terms of how you get charged and the process in terms of having your due process in court, the trial that could happen. And an important distinction with the military You may all know the Constitution requires that anyone who is going to be held for a capital offense or a felony has to be indicted by a grand jury. Well, that's not true. We're in the military. The military has a different system. An Article 32 hearing is what you have in the military, and McDonald had one of those. It's a preliminary hearing where the government essentially has to show that they have enough evidence to move forward against McDonald. And in this hearing, things don't go well for the military. The military kind of felt like they they had a slam dunk here. They really believe that the evidence pretty clearly pointed to McDonald, but the McDonald's lawyer, who would remain his lawyer throughout this whole process, really knocked it out of the park in the Article 32 hearing and was able to point to some real problems with the prosecution's case. Now, a lot of them, frankly, were more cosmetic, but they had an impact on the presiding officer. So you had a colonel who is who is presiding over this case. He's not a lawyer. So he's deciding whether or not there's enough evidence to go forward. He's not a lawyer because this is the military. He's the colonel. He's the one who's going to make the decision. He had a military jag advising him who was helping him to make this decision. But at the end of the day, he's just an ordinary guy. Kind of like, I guess, a jury is just, you know, ordinary people. And he's trying to make this decision. And the defense hammers on things that they will hammer on for really up until this day. Some mistakes that were made by the investigators. Things that might seem small, but nevertheless were important. The the military, somebody in the military hung up the phone and they picked up a flower pot that had been knocked over. And one of the big things that happened, the military was pretty convinced that this was a staged scene. So the living room... There wasn't a lot of evidence of a fight. We'll talk about that more later, but there was some. The flower pot was knocked over that I mentioned earlier. One thing was the table. There was a sort of a table in front of the couch, and it was sitting on its side. And the military guys had tried over and over and over again to knock this table over where it stayed on its side instead of falling all the way onto its face. So instead of being on the side, it's it's top heavy. It would just roll all the way over onto its face. And they kept kicking this thing over and they kicked it over in all these different ways and they could never get it to land like that. So they go to the house with this colonel who's presiding over this and he kicks it over and the first time he does it, it lands on its side. And the reason it lands on its side is because when he kicked it over, there was a chair sitting next to it. And the way he kicked it over, the chair actually held up the table so that the table stayed on its side instead of falling all the way onto its face, which meant McDonald's story suddenly was plausible. And these things had a real impact on this officer to the extent that when this was all over, he dismissed the charges against McDonald. He said he did not think McDonald was responsible, and he recommended that the civilian authorities look into the people that McDonald had described as being in his house because... Even though this happened on a military base, if if the crime was committed by civilians, civilian authorities would need to prosecute those people. As Alice said, there's weird jurisdictional things going on here. Fort Bragg's an open base. The, you know, ordinary people are traveling through it all the time. So there's some real sort of interesting jurisdictional issues that might arrive. So at this point, McDonald's free to go. The military said there's not a case here. And he starts to move on with his life. He says he's really irritated with the military. He's irritated that anybody would think he was responsible for this, and he wants out, so he gets out. He's honorably discharged, and he moves across the country to Long Beach, California, where he begins a new life as a doctor, and he says, look, I wanted to get away from everything. 
I wanted to forget about everything. So he starts to live sort of a new life. He becomes a playboy, dating a lot of women, buys a yacht, has a beachfront condo, has a nice luxury sports car, really kind of living the life now in California, leaving all of this darkness behind him. But there was one person who was really irritated by that, and that was Colette's stepfather, Freddie Kassab. Now, he considered Colette to be his daughter. It didn't matter that she wasn't his daughter by blood. And when she died, there was no one who supported McDonald more than Freddie. Freddie was completely on his side. He testified at the Article 32 hearing about McDonald and how wonderful McDonald was. To the point that he said if he had another daughter, he would want the same son-in-law. That was how much he was behind McDonald. And he expected when McDonald was acquitted that the next step would be not leaving everything behind, not forgetting everything that happened, but finding the killer. He wanted to figure out who did this. He wanted to know who killed Colette and his grandkids. And he was ready to go, but McDonald wasn't. Which, by the way, Brett, his response makes a lot more sense, right? I understand everyone processes grief differently and that McDonald may have wanted to forget about this horrible thing that happened, but this is an intense mystery if in fact someone had robbed you of your entire life. Forget what you feel about your wife, that you know you had a lackluster marriage, that maybe you never was really in love with her because you had all these trysts or whatever you want to call them, but th that was your flesh and blood, your kids one of them your unborn son, you would think that there'd be some parental tug to think, I, I need justice for my children. Who did this? What monster is this? They need to meet some sort of justice or they can't do this again. I need to stop them before they steal someone else's family. But nothing. Yeah. The person who's nothing. feeling that is a stepfather and a step-grandfather, not the husband and father of the victims. And I'm sure somebody will write in and say... How dare you guys judge him for how he reacted? Like you said, everybody reacts differently. Maybe I'm biased by our profession or by being involved in the true crime world, but I do not know of any other circumstance like this. It, typically, what you see is victims want justice. In fact, people become obsessed with finding justice, and we see that all the time. People who spend the rest of their lives trying to find who, you know, killed their kid or killed their husband or killed their wife. I mean, look at Kelsey, you know, Kelsey German, right. who has completely dedicated her adult life to um, Abby and Libby and the Delphi murders and even chosen her course of educational study based on, you know, the tragedy that befell her family. And I mean, that's that's a sister, you know, some someone immediate family. And so we see that more often. That's very common. And remember, when the FBI or law enforcement are profiling a witness, that factors in as well. Of course, not everyone reacts the same way, but there are profiles that most people fit. And wanting to know who killed your children is a very common reaction, one that McDonald does not exhibit. Yeah, and look, we struggle with this. I think we always try and point out that just because some, just because somebody acts a certain way, it does not necessarily mean they are guilty or innocent. Usually, I think that has more to do with their immediate reaction. This idea that, you know, he should be crying all the time or, you know, stuff like that. I, I, I completely don't buy that. Or the, he spoke about her in the past tense with the Scott Peterson stuff. No, that, I don't buy that. I think that stuff is all just kind of random. But I don't think that means that you can't derive anything from people's behavior. And the FBI and the Behavioral Science Unit and all those guys, they certainly don't think that. They look for these kind of patterns. They look for certain things that people tend to do that shows whether or not they might be involved. A good example of this that a lot of people know is if you find a child who's been murdered and they're wrapped in their favorite blanket, the parents did it. That is something parents do when they murder a child. Now, you know, once again, different people might react different ways to killing their kid, but that is something that the FBI has seen again and again and again as a sign that it was the parents who were involved. So, yeah, I think it is relevant that McDonald 
was ready to completely leave this behind and never ask another question about it when there was supposedly this gang of people who had murdered his entire family and tried to murder him. And yet he's just going to leave it all behind. Now, he may have wanted to forget it, and it may have seemed like he had left all of this uh, cloud uh, around him behind. But five years later, January 24th, 1975, a federal grand jury indicts McDonald for the murders of his wife and children. Now, remember we said earlier he'd been charged by the Army, and those charges were dismissed. Now, you may be thinking, wait a second, isn't isn't there something called double jeopardy? You can't be charged twice with the same crime. This is where different jurisdictions come in. This is the federal government charging McDonald. Yeah, and he actually will make that argument later on. This is the most litigated case in the history of the United States. This case has been at the Supreme Court more than any other case. This guy has, he has litigated this case like crazy. And one of the arguments he did make at some point was that this was a double jeopardy situation. And if this seems weird to you, think about it um, this way. You can be charged for the same offense in both state and federal court. And that's because those are two different sovereigns and they have their own laws. And the fact that you have violated basically two different sovereigns laws means that you could be charged at the state level as well as the federal level. This is like that. So it's now, now it's not very common to see an indictment so long after the murders. This is five years later. That's on the longer side. Of course, you've probably heard of cold cases that are cracked decades later. But here, he's been the suspect all along. Remember, he was charged soon after by the army. But the federal grand jury indicts McDonald. About a year later, he challenges this federal indictment. And January 23rd, 1976, the Fourth Circuit uh, dismisses the indictment on the grounds that McDonald's speedy trial rights were violated. Remember how we said this is an extremely litigated cases. This is one where McDonald had good counsel. They made all of the available arguments possible, and he actually wins a lot, as many interesting cases are they're appealed and ultimately we'll tell you the outcome of it but this means that the circuit court so the fourth circuit the court above it would be the u.s supreme court the fourth circuit dismissing the indictment for violation of mcdonald's speedy trial rights is a very hard standard to meet and he met it in that case the government appeals up to the u.s supreme court and Appeals take a very long time. This is something that you all should know. For example, death penalty cases are famous, famously well litigated. They go through all the courts, state and federal levels, multiple times, and those appeals take years. So is the case here. More than two years later, almost two and a half years later, the Supreme Court on May 1st, 1978, reinstates the indictment in an 8-0 decision. What that means is in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court reinstates the indictment and says the Fourth Circuit got it wrong. As you guys probably know, the U.S. Supreme Court has nine justices. If one justice does not participate for whatever reason, you have eight. An 8-0 decision means it's unanimous. That's a big deal. This is not one of those close decisions, split. Let me say this. This is interesting. Clearly, there were eight justices who participated in this case. If they were split down the middle, a 4-4 decision, what that means is the decision below stands. So if it were a 4-4 decision, the Fourth Circuit's dismissal of the indictment would have stood. And because it's the U.S. Supreme Court, that would have been the ultimate answer. So McDonald would have won, but that's not what happened. The highest court decided, no, his speedy trial rights were not violated. And this is a big deal, right? Because, you know, people always say, I'm going to take my case all the way to the Supreme Court, but that's not how it works. The Supreme Court only decides a case if they want to decide it. So they didn't have to take this case when the government appealed. They could have said, whatever, Fourth Circuit, they've done their thing. We don't care about this. We're not, we're not even going to hear this case. And McDonald would have been scot-free. But this was actually an important question about when the Speedy Trial Act applies. And I'll just tell you, I have cited this case, this Supreme Court case before, in cases involving similar issues to this. I've cited the McDonald case because that's, it's an important case 
in our sort of jurisprudence about criminal law. Alice, I want to take a moment to talk about one of our favorite sponsors for the podcast, HelloFresh. As most of you guys know, with HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. You can skip those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Brett, I love HelloFresh. With working a full-time job, being a full-time mom doing a podcast. I want to have healthy meals for my family, but it's not always possible with the time. HelloFresh makes it possible. Um, They give me the flexibility to easily customize my order on the app within minutes. This is exactly what I need for a busy lifestyle. I can easily change my delivery day, my food preferences, the meal size, or even skip a week if I happen to be out of town. And there's something for everyone to enjoy with recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. My kids and my husband gobble up every single HelloFresh meal that we've had. And if there's one thing we love as much as HelloFresh, it's Green Chef. And Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, which gives you even more flexibility and an even wider array of meal plans you can choose from. And because you're a fan of this show, you can do so at a discount. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TP14 and use code TP14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash TP14, code TP14 for 14 free meals plus free shipping. And you will learn why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Yeah, that's a great point, Brett. People may not know that there are tens of thousands of appeals filed with the Supreme Court every year, and they decide, they have oral argument for, it. honestly, the number has dropped every year. I think we're somewhere in the between 65 and 85 range of cases every year. It's different. There's no set number. But, and then they decide, a few hundred more on the papers, meaning no oral argument. In other words, it's a very small percentage of the tens of thousands of cases that are filed with the Supreme Court that are actually decided. After the Supreme Court reinstates his indictment, McDonald is not done fighting. He then attempts to bring a double jeopardy claim like we talked about earlier, but this double jeopardy claim was rejected as well. So note that he's not bringing factual challenges. He's actually bringing constitutional challenges to his indictment here. He's saying, I have speedy trial rights under the Constitution. Those were violated. Supreme Court says, nope, they weren't. He says, wait a second. Army already charged me. Double jeopardy. Same here. The courts say, no, the law, the Constitution allows this indictment to be brought against you. So we haven't even gotten to the facts. The double jeopardy claim is actually rejected by the Fourth Circuit. McDonald then attempts to appeal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court denies his appeal. So this second one is one of those where the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to hear this. As you can tell, McDonald has been very litigious on this federal indictment, and he decides to take this case all the way to trial. There are many outcomes, two major outcomes that can happen in a federal indictment. One is that you could plea. In other words, you plea guilty without a trial. You get certain benefits from that. You don't have to go through a trial. You get acceptance of responsibility, which means you get some sort of a break on your sentencing guidelines. But he decides to go to trial and maintain his innocence. The trial lasts from July 19th to August 29th in 1979. Note that he was indicted four years earlier. So it took four years to litigate all this up to the Supreme Court twice before he ultimately went to trial. The legal system is slow, guys. And there are benefits to that, and there are also drawbacks to it. It's slow. The you know the good part is you get all your claims aired out. There is time to make sure that these claims are litigated. The con, a huge con, as you can probably tell, is that it's now been almost a decade since these murders occurred and there's been no uh, conviction yet. 
But at the end of this trial in August of 1979, McDonald is convicted of two counts of second degree murder and one count of premeditated first degree murder. As a result of these convictions, he is sentenced to life. Yeah, we'll talk about why those why he was convicted of two counts of second degree murder and one count of premeditated murder once we dive in to the the evidence here. But there's actually an interesting reason that that's the way this case went. But it's not over. He's 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 fighting on. He sure is fighting on, Brett. A year later, in August of 1980, the Fourth Circuit overturns his conviction on speedy trial grounds. By the way, that's bold for the Fourth Circuit because to make this ruling, it's it's huge. It, it, it's almost unheard of for an appellate court to overturn a trial conviction, a jury conviction. They do this, and guess what? On the grounds that the Supreme Court slapped in, them down on previously. So this is actually a very interesting struggle between the Fourth Circuit and the Supreme Court here. And the reason for this, it's actually, it's actually nerd interesting. Is, so when they did it the first time, The Supreme Court was like, now it's an 8-0 decision. And you would think the Fourth Circuit would have thought, probably means this is not a successful thing. But the Supreme Court often decides things narrowly. So when the Supreme Court decided it the first time, they said, look, this is premature. You can't dismiss an indictment on speedy trial grounds. Go ahead, have the trial. Who knows? He might be acquitted. And then we don't even have to worry about this, right? So go ahead and have the trial. Maybe he'll be acquitted. Maybe he won't. But we're not going to dismiss an indictment now. Go away, Fourth Circuit. Go back and try the case. And then he does. And and he immediately raises this issue again. And the Fourth Circuit's like, see? (laughs) We were right all along. (laughs) You should have listened to us, Supreme Court. And which is usually not something the Supreme Court takes kindly to. (laughs) Well, what this means is... McDonald walks free. His conviction was overturned. He is a free man. There is no conviction standing for him. He is not a convicted murderer. So McDonald moves back to California and he resumes his life as a doctor and playboy. Now, in March March 31st, 1982, this case was appealed up to the Supreme Court yet again. And the Supreme Court again reverses the Fourth Circuit, and this time they reinstate the conviction, not in a unanimous ruling, but this time in a 6-3 ruling. So a little bit closer, not the 5-4 decisions you all hear of for particularly hot topic issues. This is a little bit closer, but with nine justices sitting on this case, it is a 6-3 ruling to reinstate the jury verdicts. Now what follows are decades of failed appeals and habeas petitions by McDonald. And that brings us to today. Many, 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 many appeals and and petitions later. As we said, this this case has been litigated to the nth degree on every possible ground. And McDonald remains in prison. And the question that we're going to address in the episodes that follow is whether he should remain in prison or if in fact he is innocent as he still maintains to this day. And there is so much to discuss. There's the blood evidence in this case, which seems to tell a very specific story. There are questions about the story McDonald told and whether or not the evidence is consistent with that. And then there is the, the most enigmatic part of this case. The woman in the floppy hat. Did she exist? And in fact, do we know who she is? And if she did exist, is McDonald innocent? Those are the questions we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. If you guys already have questions about this case, feel free to hit us up, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. We always love to hear from you guys at prosecutorspod for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Check us out on Reddit, check us out on YouTube, join our Patreon, buy a onesie for your kids. We have so many different things that you can take part in if you are a fan of this show, and we appreciate you guys so much and all the support that you give us. 
we want to thank you for telling your friends about this show. We continue to see more and more people listening to the show, and it's so great, and it makes us so happy, and we love being able to reach folks. And thank you again for all the five-star reviews you're leaving on Apple. You are a part of this team, and we could not do this show without you. Absolutely. We have the world's best fans, including those who hear us talk on Get Vocals for five hours. <laughs> That's right. I mean, the fact that some of you stuck around for five hours for that Get Vocal still blows my mind. By the time this episode comes out, we'll either be on our way to CrimeCon or just back from CrimeCon. I'm not exactly sure when this episode's going to come out. I think it'll be right before CrimeCon. So, oh, I'm so excited about CrimeCon. I am too. I can't. I've never been. Wait. I know, neither have I. I kind of feel bad about that. Maybe we shouldn't admit that. No, we we went all the time. No, no, because we I, I could never make it to it. I wasn't cool enough to go. We certainly, I mean, we were nobodies. Well, we before. certainly weren't cool enough to go. I don't know if we're cool enough to go now. <laughs> we're not cool no, enough, not but don't tell us, anybody. But Yeah, don't tell anybody. Keep that on the down low. I'll edit that part out later on. Anyway, yeah, come see us. We're going to have some stuff for you guys if you stop by. Love to talk to you, love to meet all y'all, love to take some photos, love to have some drinks. Whatever you want to do, we are there for you. So come by and see us. Should be happening very soon. We cannot wait. Well, guys, that is all we have for this week, but we will be back next week with more exciting, crazy, bizarre things about this case, one of the most bizarre and craziest cases in the history of true crime but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors watching this very strange spaghetti video. You're watching a strange really spaghetti video? It. Yeah, they like poured Wait, what? Brago sauce all over this counter and then like put meatballs on it and then put cheese on it and then put spaghetti on it. It was very strange. I didn't understand it. What? What? I left you for like five minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Minutes. It's like a thing. What are apparently. you doing? This is like a meme. I don't know. Everybody was watching this video and so I watched it and I don't understand is it. it. Like I think it was weird, supposed to be funny but I didn't Is it like a weird it fetish funny. thing? You know, I kind of wondered about that, actually, because it is a woman doing it, and she's, like, you know, rubbing all this spaghetti around on her countertop. I don't know. It's very strange. gonna watch it that sounds really weird (laughs) it was very strange like i said i don't don't have like a good Uh, feeling about why it exists uh, but weird fetish thing is definitely a possibility that is incredible thank you for sharing that super weird thing you just did you're welcome i I guess i deserved it you you did deserve it that was your fault